Hey, I'm uh, Shafiq Arifai. I'm a PGY1 internal medicine resident at Oklahoma State University. Uh, today, I will be giving a presentation on um, the shock 2 trial, the intraaortic uh, balloon pump shock 2 trial. Uh, this trial was actually a pretty groundbreaking trial in terms of um, the way it essentially changed the way we practice medicine in regards to cardiogenic shock patients. Um, and before starting um, the breaking down the trial and going into the trial, I think it is important to note that this is essentially a part two trial. Uh, the first trial was done in the early 2000s, and it was done in a tertiary university hospital as a perspective, oh, as a perspective randomized controlled and open label clinical trial. Um, there were about 45 patients, and um, the primary endpoint was not mortality, but it was end organ damage. The results of that trial was uh, pretty inconclusive, and therefore um, there was a need for a larger multi-center trial with uh, mortality as the uh, end point. So this is where the, uh, the shock 2 trial comes in. Um, so here's a quick summary of what I will be talking about today. Um, We'll go through the background cause, uh, pathophysiology. We'll go through breaking down the, uh, the, the trial itself, and then we'll have a little discussion on the facts I presented earlier. Um, so background, um, I think it's important to note that the uh, balloon pumps were used for over 20 years um, as the gold standard for uh, cardiogenic shock. Um, the definition of cardiogenic shock is essentially a decreased cardiac output with evidence of tissue hypoxia in the presence of adequate intravascular volume and they require pressors. The incidence of cardiogenic shock in approximately five to 10 percent of patients with um, acute myocardial infarction is about five to 10 percent and the mortality rate if you use um, guideline directed uh, medical uh, treatment is approximately 50%. Some sources say 70 to 80%, but most sources are saying uh, 50%. So I have here listed the causes of acute myocardial infarction. Um, there are a variety of causes, and it's important to know that um, to know that there are different causes besides the acute myocardial infarction. But the shock two trial specifically studied cardiogenic shock secondary to acute myocardial infarction. If patients came in with some sort of mechanical cause, they were excluded from the trial. So know that there are other causes of cardiogenic shock. However, the, what I'm about to talk about today will be specifically to um, acute myocardial infarction. Um, so pathophysiology, um, I'm a big proponent of understanding the natural history of um, a disease process, which includes the pathophysiology. Um, I think when you understand the pathophysiology, it makes management and treatment easier to understand, easier to remember. And honestly, at that point, you're more of an expert on that disease process. So um, on a very superficial level, cardiogenic shock is the heart's not working. It's not the blood's not getting to the tissue, you have hypoxia, and um, th which causes um, further ischemia, right? But um, in reality, it's um, a pretty complex process. And I think this illustration right here does a pretty good job of demonstrating the um, downward spiral that cardiogenic shock actually causes. So let's go through it a bit. I'll take a little time just because um, I think it is important to know before starting um, uh, breaking down the actual trial. So when you have a critical mass of the left ventricular uh, myocardium, secondary to ischemia or uh, necrosis, secondary to ischemia, you have, it fails to pump, you have a decrease in stroke volume and cardiac output. So um, you, what that causes is um, a difference in the coronary artery um, arterial system and the left ventricle during uh, dias diastole. So what's gonna happen is this will further uh, increase the ischemia. And then you'll have um, things like um, the elevated uh, heart rate and um, increased preload. That will further increase the, um, the ischemia. Then you'll have your uh, compensatory mechanisms, which your increased uh, SVR, 
that will cause an increase in afterload. And so that will also um, uh, increase the ischemia that was already there. So um, what ends up ha happening is progressive myocardial dysfunction, which um, if left untreated, um, will ultimately result in death. So uninterrupted cardiogenic shock will ultimately result uh, in death. So let's get into the study for um, now. The study design, it was a randomized controlled trial. There were 600 patients. Uh, the, the randomization was performed centrally via an internet-based program, and it was stratified by center. Um, it was non-blinded, non and it was analyzed via an intention-to-treat process. Um, I think this is a good uh, little flowchart of how they, how they um, assign patients. So 790 patients initially, 190 were excluded for a variety of reasons. We'll, we'll get into the uh, exclusion criteria here in a minute. 600 were randomly assigned. So um, I just want to point out a few things in this uh, flow chart that I'd like for you guys to remember. Just keep in the back of your head until we get to the discussion part. Um, of the 301 randomly assigned um, to the balloon pump, 13 did not receive a balloon pump, okay? Uh, and the and the reasons right 10, 10 died before the insertion. And then you have 299, the assigned to the control group. Um, keep in the, in the back of your head that um, th there were 30 crossover to the intra aortic balloon pump. So, uh, so right now, I'm just going to present the facts. We'll present the facts and then we'll, um, in the discussion part, we'll go a little more into um, what this means and what um, it and how it could change uh, some things, right? So uh, methods, we'll talk about the inclusion criteria. Um, they must have had an acute myocardial uh, infarction. And I think it's important to note that it was with or without ST elevation. So uh, n STEMIs counted. Um, cardiogenic shock by the following criteria. So a blood pressure of less than 90 greater, and greater uh, than 30 minutes who required pressors to maintain a blood pressure of greater than 90. Um, clinical signs of pulmonary uh, congestion and impaired end organ perfusion. And another big uh, inclusion criteria was early revascularization must have been planned. So if they had cardiogenic shock in the setting of an acute MI, but there was no plan for revascularization, then these patients were not included in, these, in this trial. Uh, exclusion criteria. So if these patients, if any patient received uh, resuscitation for greater than 30 minutes, they were excluded. A coma with fixed dilated pupils, uh, mechanical cause of cardiogenic shock, like we talked about earlier, this was strictly for um, acute myocardial infarction. Uh, if patients had no intrinsic heart action, um, the onset of a shock was greater than 12 hours before screening, um, massive pulmonary embolism, age greater than 90, or any contraindication to the insertion of uh, intra aortic balloon pump. So here's a slide that talks a little about the characteristics of the patients. It was pretty equal um, on both sides for the most part, but I'd like to um, point out two uh, characteristics. The number of resuscitation before randomization, 127 on the intraortic balloon pump, and then a 143 in the control group. And then the uh, other one that kind of caught my eye was the left ventricular ejection fraction. The median ejection fraction in both groups was um, approximately 35%. Okay, so uh, intervention group versus the control group. So in the intervention group, um, they received the uh, balloon pump. And um, this is interesting. It was in, uh, inserted either before the PCI or immediately after the PCI. And this was actually at the discretion of the uh, physician. So um, again, I'm gonna ask you to remember that fact. We'll discuss it a little more in the discussion uh, portion of this talk. Um, 
and also the interventional group, we, it was weaned when the blood pressure was greater than 90 for greater than 30 minutes without support. And the duration of um, balloon pump was approximately uh, three days. And then the control group, they did not get a um, intra aortic uh, balloon pump. It was more of uh, medical management. So outcome measures, uh, the primary endpoint in this study was um, to study the 30 day all cause mortality. And then secondary endpoints were serial assessments of serum lactate levels, creatinine clearance, C-reactive protein levels, and the um, severity of disease, which was assessed by the SAPS-2 score. So um, interestingly, um, the shock one trial was, um, it kind of measured what these secondary endpoints, and then this is building on what that trial was doing. And, that, and this is uh, measuring the, um, 30 day um, all cause mortality. So, before going on to um, the statistical analysis of this um, study, I'd like to give a little refresher on the actual statistics. That way, we have a good understanding and it will kind of help us understand um, what was uh, going on. So, there are two statistical hypotheses, right? There's the null hypothesis and there's the um, alternative hypothesis. The null hypothesis is essentially a hypothesis that shows no difference or relationship. The alternative hypothesis is there is some difference or relationship, right? Then we have um, the outcomes of statistical hypothesis testing. You have correct results and incorrect results, just like in any situation, you're either right or you're wrong. But um, the correct results, there's really one way to be right, then you've got your incorrect, which is essentially a type one error and a type two error. Um, I'll start with a type two error, um, which essentially states that there is not an effect or difference when um, one exists. So um, the null hypothesis is not rejected when it is in fact false. So beta, that would be the beta, and it would be the probability of making a type two error. And this is related to the statistical power, right? So I think it's important to touch on the power for a second. To increase the power and decrease the beta, you either increase the sample size, increase the expected effect size, or increasing the precision of the um, measurement. So um, on this slide right here, I'll talk a little about the type one error. So um, alpha is the probability of making a type one error. The P value is judged against a preset alpha level of significance, which is usually um, 0 0.05. If P is less than 0 0.05, then there is less than a 5% chance that the data will show something that is not really there. So alpha is, in other words, known as the false positive error. So a real life example of alpha would be, um, say the null hypothesis would be, person is not guilty of the crime. However, for some reason, um, for um, whatever flaws there may be in the system, a that specific person may be judged as guilty when the person actually did not commit the crime. So there are costs for um, a type one error, right? Um, doing this would be sending an innocent person to prison, denying them their personal freedom, which um, really is a pretty big deal, right? I mean, your freedom is, Pretty important. And I was going to make a, uh, a joke about, you know, some of the um, some of the shows going on right now, but I figured I'd stay away from it. You guys can uh, put whatever names you want to to this uh, type one error, right? So um, we have. So let's get into the statistical analysis. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to. So I gave you a quick brief. Um, explanation of what type one errors were and uh, the types of hypotheses. And then as we go, I'll kind of go back to um, what I said and we'll um, 
delve a little more into it also. So in this study, the global type one error level was set at 0 0.05. And they said the trial um, would be discontinued if the null hypothesis of equal survival rates was rejected at a significance level of 0 0.005 at the first interim analysis or 0 0.014 at the second um, interim analysis. So an independent data and safety monitoring uh, board conducted the interim analyses after enrollment of 33% and 66% of the patients uh, respectively. So I want to point out that setting a significance level has the advantage that the analyst is not tempted to choose a cutoff on the basis of values. And they would have rejected the null hypothesis and stopped the trial. So basically, the trial was never stopped and it continued um, because they never, so, and they were never had to really reject the uh, hypothesis. Um, Interestingly, the study was powered to detect a 12% absolute reduction in the mortality, assuming a 56% mortality rate in the control group. And the final uh, analysis undertaken was with an alpha of 0 0.044. Um, so the alpha threshold is usually lowered in attempt to avoid false positives. And um, so hypothesis tests are always better with more data, right? And it turns out that the chance of a type one error can be reduced by either increasing the sample size of the experiment, and it, it, would, it needs to be large enough to ensure that a practical difference can be detected. So another way is if you really want to avoid type one errors, you can control the likelihood of a type one error by changing the level of significance. So the probability of a type one error is equal to alpha. And if you want to avoid them, we can lower the uh, significance level. So um, like I mentioned earlier, um, the trial continued because they never met that value in the interim uh, analyses. So this is a quick uh, table of the uh, results and clinical outcomes. Um, the point, the p-value of the primary endpoint at um, 30 days was 0.69 with a relative risk of 0.96 and a confidence interval of 0.79 to uh, 1.17. And um, before we really talk about the results, I just wanted to have this in here because I think it is important to note, um, among the patients in the control group, 30 of them ended up receiving an uh, intraoral balloon pump, most within the first 24 hours. And then 13 patients assigned to the IABP group did not end up receiving the uh, balloon pump. So that's just something to, uh, just to note, right? And this, um, this figure right here, I think does a, does a good job of showing us how um, closely the control and the balloon pump did um, with the uh, p-values that we just discussed earlier. So this right here is um, just a figure from the, from the study, and it shows, again, that everything is pretty, um, pretty even between the two. Um, interestingly, though, it did show age of less than 50 years seemed to do um, well with the uh, balloon pump. And so the results with the primary endpoint, um, among the 277 patients uh, in whom received balloon pump uh, and underwent revascularization, there, there was no significant difference in mortality. Um, and this was before receiving um, the balloon pump, before PCI or after PCI. So I think that is important to note. Um, and all of the data that was analyzed was according to an intention to treat principle. Um, a per protocol analysis of the primary endpoint was performed and included data from all the patients um, with the exclusion of those who crossed over.
And so they also found that there was no uh, significance. And then here, the results for the secondary endpoints, the serum lactate levels were similar. The renal function at baseline during the daily follow-up did not differ significantly. The C-reactive protein levels were significantly lower at baseline of the control group than in the uh, IABP group. And then the SEPS2 score, which is the score that measures um, disease uh, severity, was significantly lower in the uh, intra-aortic balloon uh, group. So let's start with the discussion. Um, the primary study endpoint, the 30-day alcohol mortality, occurred in similar proportion as we uh, mentioned earlier. Um, the sample size calculation for the um, shock 2 trial was based on an anticipated 30-day mortality of 56% in the control group. This gives an 80% power to detect a 12% absolute reduction in mortality with the um, IABP insertion. However, the observed mortality rate in the control group was significantly lower than anticipated, which may either indicate that the, um, that the enrolled patient population was either a lower risk cohort than predicted, and um, nevertheless, despite the remarkable feat of having randomized 600 patients with cardiogenic shock, um, this trial actually um, at the end of the day really um, didn't power it enough because they powered it for the 56%, the anticipated 30 day mortality rate of 56%. But because they observed a 40%, it wasn't, uh, it lacked the sufficient power to address its primary hypothesis, right? And so really with 40% power, you would need around 900 patients, which really is hard to do because having 600 patients in itself was, um, like I said, a pretty remarkable um, feat. So um, even with the uh, analyses, I think um, increasing the sample size, I don't know that it really would have caused a, uh, a uh, benefit to the IABP, but it's just, an interesting thing to point out. And then the other thing that we mentioned earlier was the crossover. Um, in this trial, there were 43 patients total that were crossed over. Um, 30 from the control group to the uh, balloon pump and 13 from the balloon pump to the control group. Uh, the impact of crossover on the overall result can be difficult to evaluate. And it really depends on the frequency of the crossover um, like I mentioned earlier, a per protocol analysis of the shock 2 data, uh, which excluded all the crossover patients, revealed similar results to the primary intention to treat analysis. So patients from the control group who went to the uh, balloon pump group ended up having a lower mortality rate than who, those who went from the balloon pump uh, to control group. So excluding this may have um, caused a loss of important data, but because of the per protocol and the intention to treat analyses, there was still no significant, um, no significant in uh, the difference. So over here, back just uh, reminding you guys of the uh, characteristics of the patients in the study group. Um, and then the other point is, so, the timing of the balloon pump placement. So like I mentioned earlier, 86.6% of the patients who underwent balloon pump insertion after PCI, they underwent balloon pump insertion after PCI. So that's a uh, pretty uh, big number. So just reading on um, cardiogenic shock and um, uh, PCIs, in patients presenting with cardiogenic shock, the risk of hemodynamic compromise is typically greatest uh, during PCI. So um, for, for a variety of reasons, it um, triggers the spiral of ischemia, reduces the contractility, diminishes the myocardial perfusion. So it kind of, I know that, so some of the critiques were, 
some of the cardiologists were asking, does, were the uh, severity of disease in the study patient population not, um, were they, does it really speak to the acuity of the situation? Would it have benefited if the patients were a little more acute rather than receiving it after um, PCI? Um, however, um, again, there was no statistically significant difference between the minority who received balloon pump insertion before PCI or um, after and the overall cohort. So it still remains unclear, but um, I think with the data, I think it's still. And so the discussion we have the, um, so just the strength of the trial and the weakness of the trial, the strengths include randomized, it was a randomized control. Um, the, the allocation concealment was maintained. There was minimal loss to follow up and it was a multi-center um, trial. Weaknesses of the trial was, um, it was non-blinded. There was a high crossover rate from the control to the intervention treatment and vice versa, like we mentioned earlier. And there was no specific criteria for when a left ventricular assist device was used in the uh, control group. I think three of them, but they, there was never really a specific criteria. And they also, um, the measurement of the of shock was more non-invasive. So I know there was some critiques on that. And so future directions um, in the circulation meeting at the American Heart Association in 2018, there was a six year follow up and it showed a uh, no mortality benefit to the uh, balloon pump versus medical management. And then looking at the use of non uh, balloon pump or cutaneous uh, circulatory devices, ECMO, non cutaneous centrifugal pumps, um, there have been some retrospective studies done with mortality as endpoint on other circular devices, but no um, large multi-centered uh, randomized trials. So it would be interesting to see um, if that were to get done. Um, and here are my um, references and um, feel free to call, text, email with any questions. My, so this is Dr. Chronister. I'm with Dr. Connell and Dr. Alafai. We're in a luxurious uh, <laughs> recording studio here on the campus of OSU Medical Center. Um, so clinical correlations for this, um, I think Dr. Alafai mentioned most of them. I think that historically speaking, so this, this study was done in 2012. Um, before that, intraaric balloon pumps were a class 1B recommendation in the United States, 1C in Europe. After the study, um, Europe went from a 1C to a 2B. And then the United States was like, screw it. Uh, we're going to stay at 1B. We like how we do it. Um, most of the ideas about an intraortic balloon pump come from physiologic studies, uh, where we feel pretty confident physiologically that uh, balloon pumps help systemic hemodynamics. It reduces oxygen consumption of the myocardium, and it um, improves backflow of blood into the coronary vasculature. And I think that data is relatively undisputed. And so studies before the SHOCK-2 trial were effectively observational studies and were um, retrospective analyses. And so we're like, physiologically makes sense. Um, I'm doing this for my patients and observationally, I see an improvement, um, but we don't have any big randomized control studies to prove the concept. And so that's why everyone got really excited about the SHOCK-2 trial of saying, wow, we've got 600 patients, we're randomizing them, uh, and we're going to finally see that all the physiologic and observational data we've accumulated over the years uh, comes to fruition, and we're going to pat ourselves on the back. And then SHOCK-2 comes out and says no mortality benefit at 30 days. Okay, fine, whatever. Let's look at it in a year. One year, no benefit mortality. Crap. Okay, let's look at six years no benefit. Crap. <laughs> um, so now we're left with the idea of, well, I believe what I believe, so let me pick apart the trial to demonstrate why my observations are still correct. Um, and I think Dr. Alfly mentioned most of them um, uh, that we're looking at. So this study, again, looked at a 12% difference or delta between the two groups in mortality, um, indicating that it would not be powered if there was less than a 12% difference. Again, they're also looking at a 56 or assuming a 56% mortality rate in the control, which was about 
higher than what they actually found, thus indicating a less severe um, cohort of patients. So how does that work into powering the entire study? Um, that's debatable. I still think that for most cardiologists, most thoracic surgeons, most internists who see intrathoracic or intraaortic balloon pumps, we still find that they are anecdotally very beneficial and are a life-saving mechanism. Um, does that prove out in the study? Absolutely not. Uh, has it changed treatment? Um, I don't think it's really changed treatment. I think from 2013, these STEMI guidelines still have it as a 1B recommendation. When they update those, I'll be interested to see if this study alone is enough to, to move the needle. For the last seven years, it has not been enough. So I'm going to pass over to Dr. Connell, let her talk about uh, anything on the statistics side that she found interesting. Yeah, so this is Dr. Connell here again in this lovely recording studio. Um, so I think Dr. Alrafai pointed out several, um, he did a great job with the false positive and all that. I'm gonna circle back to that because that, um, that was the point that he was supposed to discuss with his article. But I also just wanna um, talk about a couple of things that he pointed out and that Dr. Conister's already mentioned that I think are huge when it comes to analyzing studies. Um, the fact that the study, the control arm didn't hit the mortality um, rate that you expected, um, that's kind of a red flag because does it say that we didn't have sick enough patients? Did we not have enough patients? Um, and and I've, I found that as I read through studies with the fine tooth comb, I'm finding that more and more that your control arm never met what you expected. And so then you look and go, well, if the treatment arm works or doesn't work, well, did it because your control arm didn't do what you predicted it would do. Um, the other thing I think that's important to note is the crossover rate. Um, so looking at crossover, especially in these types of studies, is important. And they did have a pretty high crossover rate. I think we can have a little bit more confidence um, in that, in the fact that the per protocol and the intention to treat were the same. If your per protocol showed different results, then that's a red flag. Um, the fact that they met the same answer um, gives a little bit more confidence. But again, you have other reasons to go, well, does this really work? Um, going back to um, the question that Dr. Alrafai was supposed to answer is talking about the type 1 error. Um, I think he did a great job explaining type 1 and type, um, type 2 error. And um, that's something that's really important to look at in the fact that um, we don't want to have a false positive, especially considering a lot of times when our, our experimental group, you're talking about something that's either um, more invasive or more expensive because it's a new drug. So if you get a false positive, um, you could potentially be giving somebody something that maybe it won't harm them any more than the old treatment, but they also may be paying out who knows how much in medical costs. Um, and so the, those are just things to think about from an economic standpoint. Um, the interim analysis um, power does drive your interim analysis. And so when you look at the alpha level of being um, 0.05, that's standard across the industry. Um, you know, again, like Dr. Alrafai said, it basically tells us that if we did this trial 100 times, we would get a false answer five times. Well, in the interim analysis, when they dropped it to 0 0.0005, they're basically saying, well, we know we don't have the power, we don't have enough people in the study at that interim analysis to say yes or no. So they're dropping their power. So they're saying, okay, now with this math, we are only going to get a false number one in 10,000 times. And so and that's why those interim analysis, if they, because if they stopped the study, did they stop it appropriately? Um, did they have enough people? Did they lower their alpha level? Um, this study didn't stop, but you see, um, you see several studies where they do stop and you have to ask those questions about, was their interim analysis done appropriately? Um, and that can only be done really in hindsight. But again, when you're picking apart an article, things to think about, especially if it was an article on a study that was stopped earlier. So um, good job, you hit all the, most of the things that I had, um, all the major points of why you would chew this article to pieces. And as Dr. Cronister pointed out, it hasn't really changed anything that we do. All right, well, thank you guys for tuning in. We appreciate it. <laughs>